Praise the Lord, everybody. It is awesome to be here. Let's all stand. Woke up this morning thinking about my Jesus, thinking I am privileged enough to get to walk into this place and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he's great and greatly to be praised. Can we lift our hands right now and welcome him in this place? Heavenly Father, we... We thank you and we praise you, God, for what you're going to do in this place today, God. Lord, we ask you to anoint, God, every word, every song, God. We ask you to anoint, God, the, spe the, the speaker's lips, God. We thank you. We never want to fail to give you the honor and the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, worship with them as they sing.
Oh, we serve a great God this morning. He answers your call whenever you call on his name. He's as close as the mention of his name. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother today. Aren't you thankful to serve that kind of God who answers your need whenever you need it? When you call on his name, he's there this morning. Thankful to serve that kind of God today. If you return into your Bibles to Philippians chapter number two, we'll start with verse number 12 this morning. Before I get started, I want to give honor to pastor for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Our young people can be dismissed at this time. I give honor to him and so thankful for his leadership and even through everything that's been going on, the craziness, he's stood fast as a great leader and I'm so thankful for him. Thankful for our ministry team who's done such a great job speaking lately. I mean, I've been blessed so much by the preached word. And didn't Brother Mark do a great job this Wednesday night? I love, that was a great message. Philippians chapter two, verse 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, working out your own salvation is very important this morning. You're supposed to do it with fear and trembling. That's how important this is. I believe in what Paul is talking about in regards to working out your own salvation is he's talking about personal convictions. You see, we must get a grasp on personal convictions. It's so important for us to get that in these last days, to know what we believe in, to stand up for our personal convictions. And that's what I believe God has assigned me to speak on this morning. So I'm gonna speak on the topic of personal convictions. We'd all bow our heads and pray this morning. God, we thank you, we worship you today. We thank you for bringing us here to your house. God, we pray that you would move upon us, move within us today, anoint our ears to hear. God, anoint my lips to speak exactly what you have for this congregation this morning. We will not fail to give you the glory and honor and praise that you deserve this morning because you're worthy of it all today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. If you've been in church very long, you've probably heard that the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The problem, though, is that this scripture is often taken out of context in most cases. You see, many people will use this verse to prove their point that there are many ways to get to heaven. This couldn't be any further from the truth. You see, the Bible also says that broad is the gate, wide is the way to destruction, but straight is the gate and narrow is the way to eternal life. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man could come to the Father except by him. The Bible says that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's only one way to live. There's only one belief system and object of faith that we have. But people, they so often take verses out of context just to prove their point instead of taking the scripture in the context of where it comes from. You see, I wanted to make this point first and foremost today because if you ever want to understand certain verses of scripture, you must take them in context. So let's look at the context surrounding our opening passage this morning. The book of Philippians is an epistle to the church at Philippi written by the Apostle Paul. It is believed that this letter by Paul was written while he was in prison for preaching the gospel. 
The church he was writing to was found in the city of Philippi, which was not very far from the Aegean Sea, about 10 miles in ancient Macedonia, which was a Roman colony at the time. This area is part of the northern portion of Greece today. You see, this church's founding, you can see it in the chapter 16 of the book of Acts. I do want to cover what happens in Acts 16 to help us understand what led to the founding of this church. I believe there are several different things that kind of mirror what happens in Philippians, what Paul talks about versus what happened in Acts chapter 16. So Paul and Silas, they were traveling all over the Roman Empire, establishing churches and preaching the gospel. This is actually an interesting story because the Bible says that the Holy Ghost forbade them from going to Asia. And when they had determined to go to Bithynia, the Holy Ghost pushed them another way. Instead, Paul, he has a vision of a Macedonian man that said to him, come over into Macedonia and help us. How awesome is that this morning? God pointed Paul directly to Macedonia through a vision. I don't know about you, but that's, I like that kind of stuff. When I see visions or miracles like that in the Bible to point you in the direction. Because that tells you God definitely appointed for them to be there. He made sure they were going in that direction. God denied Paul from going to other places, but rather he showed him to go to this specific place in Macedonia. See, this is important because it's so important to be sensitive to the voice of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. And Paul was open to that, so he followed this instruction and he goes to Macedonia. Paul and his group of men, they traveled there and they come upon the city of Philippi, which was one of the greatest cities in Macedonia. And they stayed there for a certain amount of time. It's not really given how long they stayed. But on the Sabbath, they went out of the city and they went by the riverside to pray just outside of Philippi. And there, there they found a prayer group of mostly women and they began to speak the gospel to those women. Lydia was one of them. She heard the men of God and God opened up her heart to receive the word. She believed on what Paul spoke and she was baptized along with her whole household. You see, the word of God being spoken by the man of God led her to life change. The word should always do that. It should always lead to life change. So Lydia, she's baptized in her household, and she then opens up her house to these men of God to stay there. So they stayed there, and one of the days they went out to pray, and this demon-possessed woman begins to follow them. And she begins to pronounce their identity to all these people and make them more known than really what they were trying to do. She did this for several days until Paul just had enough and he cast the demon out of the woman. This caused an uproar in Philippi as this was not something the Romans approved of. Again, this is a Roman colony. So when they see the preaching of these things and they see somebody casting out demons, they didn't want to have any of that. That's not what they believed in. So they took Paul and Silas and they threw him in prison. But this is, you know, a familiar story where Paul and Silas are in the prison. Brother Mark talked about it on Wednesday night. You see, Paul and Silas were beaten and thrown into the uttermost, the innermost part of the prison where there was no light. It was right in the center. It's where they put the worst criminals so they could not escape. And that's where the Romans put Paul and Silas. But at midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray. They began to sing praises to God. So much, they sang it so loud that all the prisoners can hear them in the entire prison. But as they begin to sing praises to God... An earthquake began to shake the place. 
begin to shake the prison where the foundation began to crack and the prison doors began to swing open and swing wide and the bonds were loosed off the prisoners. Awaking out of a nice nap on the job, the keeper of the prison, he sees these doors open and he sees the prisoners loose. And when he sees this, he nearly kills himself because he knows if these prisoners escaped, he was dead meat anyway. He knew the Romans would torture him if he let them escape. So he thought he would just kill himself, end it, get it over with. But thankfully, Paul cries out to him with a loud voice, assuring him that everyone remained in their cells and that he did not have to kill himself. You see, the keeper, he then goes to Paul and Silas in their cells and he falls down on his face and trembles before them. He realized there was power inside these men. So Paul and Silas, they knew there was an opportunity to witness to this keeper of the prison. So as the keeper of the prison brings them outside, he asks them, what should I do to be saved? When you see a miracle like that, you should turn to God. You should turn to the men of God and say, what should I do to be saved? And Paul, he tells them, you believe on Jesus Christ. You believe on his commandments. You believe on what he preached, you can be saved. So the entire household of this keeper, they all are baptized in Jesus' name, and they believed on the words of Paul and Silas. You see, through Lydia's family and the family of the keeper of the prison, the church of Philippi was established those days. What's amazing to me is that a church that was partially started by Paul, witnessing to the keeper while in prison, Paul eventually writes to that same church while he again is in prison. So there's some parallels here. But now that we see how this church came to be, we can understand more thoroughly the reasoning by, behind Paul's epistle to them. In the book of Philippians, Paul is trying to encourage this church to continue living the Christian life. Paul wanted to show them the joy of living this Christian lifestyle. It was a letter of encouragement to keep fighting the good fight in, a way, in this way. Paul helped establish this church, but now he wanted to encourage them to keep on going. Even while in the midst of a prison cell, Paul tells the church at Philippi, Keep on living for God. It's going to be worth it. It's worth living for God. Even if he was in prison, he knew it was worth living for God. Even if it put him through persecution, even when it put him through the craziness and the torture of the Roman Empire, he knew it's going to be worth it. So this testimony of Paul, it helps encourage these Philippians. And Paul, he tells this church to be like-minded and of one accord. He instructs them to let nothing be done through strife or pride. But he tells them to be humble and esteem their brother higher than themselves. Paul wants them to have this attitude because it was the attitude of Christ. Though Christ was God in the flesh, he thought it was not robbery to become a man. And to become of no, no reputation and of no fame, he came humbly to be a servant and to become obedient unto his own death on the cross that he might be glorified. You see, we are to humble ourselves in obedience in that same way. We must be obedient to the will and the word of God, even if it would mean death. We are to do it all for the glory of God. It's with this understanding of the Philippian church being obedient that Paul tells them to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. As I said at the onset of this message this morning, working out your own salvation is the same as finding and living out your personal convictions. 
This is something to be done with fear and with trembling. Just as the keeper of the prison came before Paul and Silas and bowed down, trembling before them, asking what he must do to be saved, we must come before God in the same way regarding our personal convictions. We should humble ourselves before him, being ready to listen to him and to follow his lead. Personal convictions are so important and they're vital to our Christian lives. It is a serious thing and not something to be taken lightly. We constantly need to be reviewing and assessing our personal convictions. We need to see if we are following them or if we're straying away from them. But we cannot have personal convictions without first being obedient to the word of God. Biblical law will always trump what your personal opinion is. Paul does not tell the Philippians to work out their own salvation until he talks about obedience. Paul wanted to emphasize humble obedience to the will and the word of God before he ever started talking about personal convictions. Because it's upon the word that our convictions should be formed. Paul remembers how obedient Lydia and the prison keeper and all the people of Philippi were when he was present with them. He also has heard the stories of how they've been obedient even in his time away when he's not with them and not checking up on them. They still lived a life of obedience to what they had been taught. So we understand that this obedience to the gospel they could begin to form personal convictions now with that obedience. You see, there are too many so-called Christians in our world today who just want to live according to their opinions and not according to the word of God. This is going to seem like a strong statement this morning, but it is the truth. You cannot truly be a Christian if you do not believe in the absolute authority of the inspired word of God. The word of God should hold ultimate authority over us in our lives. Above all other law, above all other opinion or idea, the word of God stands alone. Everything we need to know about God and about how we must live our lives is found in the word of God. The word of God will never return void and it will never die. Psalms 119.89 says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In Matthew 5, 17 through 18, Jesus says it this way. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. You see, opinions will always change. But the word of God will never change. It's for se- forever settled in heaven. Not even the dotting of the I or the crossing of the T will pass away from the law and the word of God. The word will always stand strong. No matter the time, no matter the situation, no matter the person, there is no better way to live than by the word of God. It is our holy constitution. It is our ultimate instructor and teacher. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Paul says that all scripture is profitable. 
All scripture is given to guide us. All scripture is worthy to live by. And it's the measuring stick for everything we do in life. What we learn and have been assured of through the word of God is what we need to live according to. It's through the word that we strive for heaven's reward. This passage of scripture also shows that we cannot just pick and choose what scriptures we want to follow. We are to follow the whole of scripture. We are to follow the word of God in context with the rest of the word of God. So when we form our personal convictions, we must first hold them up to the word of God. A good way to look at this is by comparing it to the way laws are made in this country. Here in the United States, we have a document that is the basis for our government, how it works, and how it is to create laws. That document is the Constitution. And when Congress creates a bill, when it has passed through the House and Senate, and when the president has signed it through, the bill is sent to the Supreme Court to make a final decision as to whether it is constitutional or not. This means that they decide whether the bill is congruent or in line with the Constitution. If it is, the bill can become a law. If not, the bill is shot down and will not become a law. This is how we should form our personal convictions. The word of God is our Christian constitution. Our convictions are like laws that we are trying to create for our own personal lives. If those convictions don't line up, with the word of God, then we should not live them out. We should change them. But if the convictions do line up with the word of God, then live them out. Act upon them. Above all, the word of God should be the supreme authority in our lives. The Philippians were not only obedient to the truth, but they were also obedient to their spiritual leadership. They were obedient to Paul and Silas. They were obedient to the apostles and men of God. The church at Philippi was submitted to their spiritual leadership. And Paul, he knew that spiritual leadership was very important. So he ends up sending Timothy to be a leader there while he is in prison. Your personal conviction should never go outside of what our pastor preaches You see, God sent him to this area to start a church, just as Paul was sent to Philippi. Our pastor is a God-appointed leader for this church. We must be submitted to our pastor. I thank God that we have a Bible-believing, truth-preaching, Holy Ghost-filled pastor. I'm thankful... For his guidance and his instruction. He stays in the word. And he preaches exactly what we need to hear. I'm thankful for a pastor that preaches the necessity of repentance. Baptism in Jesus name. And the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for a pastor that preaches the oneness of God. And I'm thankful for a pastor that preaches holiness. He preaches the truth and nothing but the truth. We have a pastor who we can trust in and we must be submitted to his leadership and his guidance for our church in our personal lives. Submission to spiritual leadership is something that is lacking in these last days. We live in a generation that does not want to listen to authority. They just want to do their own thing. Submission and obedience to spiritual leadership is something that has become unpopular. But just because the world doesn't like it, and just because even some Christians don't even like it, that does not mean that it's any less important. In fact, obedience to our spiritual leadership is vital to us. So if pastor says to do something a certain way, That's the way we ought to do it. Even if another church does it another way, we must be obedient to our pastor. 
Just because another pastor does it one way doesn't make it right for our congregation. You see, pastor prays daily for this church. He loves this church. And pastor knows what is best for this church. If pastor sets a standard for something, that is the standard we must follow. You see, standards are still important for the 21st century church. Standards are still important for this church. We do, however, need to understand what a standard is. Standards are the application of doctrinal principles for the church. Standards are the way biblical precepts are applied to each person or each church. Standards are not necessarily doctrines, but rather they're how the doctrines are used to guide certain actions and lifestyle choices. In a corporate sense, certain standards may differ from church to church based on their pastor's discretion. The congregation should be obedient to the standards that their pastor has put in place. These are the corporate standards set up by the spiritual leadership, and they are used to unify the church in obedience, as well as guide them toward where God is calling them to. But we must also learn that our personal convictions are our personal standards. Our personal standards should follow suit in with the corporate standards our pastor instructs our church to follow. We must understand that it is okay for personal standards to go above the standards our pastor has set, but they should never go below them. If it is your personal conviction to be more strict in a certain area, that is your right and you should follow that. But your personal convictions should never put you lower than the standard pastor sets up for this church. It should be our goal to go above and beyond, to go further and not to just do the bare minimum or even less than the bare minimum. We should want to go above and beyond for God. He deserves more than just the least of it. He deserves more than just our bare minimum, the minimum requirement. He deserves more from us. He died on the cross for our sins so we didn't have to die. He died on the cross so we could have eternal life with him. Why would we just do the bare minimum for that kind of God? Why would we just do what is required and not go above and beyond to try to be better? You see, the bare minimum is the word of God, the entire word of God at face value. But how you apply that word can take you further. It can take you beyond. We must learn to apply the word of God and apply the instruction of our pastor to form our personal convictions. But you will have trouble forming convictions if you are not led by the Holy Ghost. Just as Paul was led of the Holy Ghost to go to Philippi, we must also be led of the Holy Ghost. Paul tells the Philippians that it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Paul is talking about the leading of the Holy Ghost in regards to personal convictions here. It is the spirit of God in us that leads us to do and to will to do his good pleasure. When you are obedient to the word of God and you are obedient to your spiritual leadership, it is much easier to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. When you're not submitted and when you are not obedient, you will never listen for the voice of God. You will never listen for the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you are not first obedient and submitted. You see, a submitted and humble saint is much easier for God to lead than a rebellious and a prideful saint. We must be led by the Spirit 
and not led by our flesh when it comes to our personal convictions. Romans 8, 6 says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When you are carnally minded, you will lead yourself down a path of destruction and of death. But when you are spiritually minded, you will lead yourself down a path of life and of peace. When you allow your flesh to control your mind, your personal convictions will suffer, and so will your salvation. But when you allow the Spirit to guide you, when you allow Jesus to guide you, your personal convictions will be strengthened, and you will stay in a path toward that heavenly reward. Paul, later in his epistle to the Philippians, he writes this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I love the wording that Paul uses here. He says, I press toward the mark. You see, our convictions should not allow us to stand idly by and never grow. Rather, our personal convictions should help us press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. You see, that prize is our heavenly reward. We need to press toward heaven. Not just nonchalantly walking toward it, but we need to be pressing toward heaven. Pressing takes effort. So when we are doing that with our convictions, our personal convictions, it's going to take a little bit of effort. Your personal convictions should challenge you to go deeper and to go further in God. You see, that's truly the purpose of having your own personal convictions and working out your own salvation. They push us closer to God in our personal lives. They help us to go further and further in God. Our personal convictions help us go above and go beyond just the bare minimum. They help us go above and beyond what is just required. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says this, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Right. You see, the point of personal convictions is to cleanse ourselves of the filthiness in our flesh and in our spirit. Our personal conviction should always lead us to a repentant heart. But those convictions also help us in perfecting holiness and the fear of God. Pastor has spoken about perfecting holiness several times. And he always defines perfecting from the original Greek word. And that word literally means to fulfill further. So we are to fulfill further holiness. This basically means we are to keep going further and further to be holy as our God is also holy. Right. We must strive further each day to be more like God. We must fulfill further holiness. Right. Our personal conviction should always help us to do just that. But our personal convictions will be lost without a fear of God. The fear of God is so important in helping form our personal convictions. Without a genuine respect, reverence, and awe for God, you will not feel the need for convictions. So many people forget that God is all-powerful. At least they only see him as all-powerful when they need something from him. Many forget that one day there will be a judgment seat experience. 
They forget that one day God will judge them and that they'll either be condemned to hell or accepted into heaven. There are too many without conviction. They only want to worry about the quote unquote heaven or hell issues. James 4, 17 says this, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. Last time I checked, sin was a heaven or hell issue. So if you know to do good and you do it not, I think you can do the math on that. I know that's a hard pill to swallow today, but it's the truth. That's why we have to follow the word of God. That's why we must be submitted to our pastor. That's why we must heed the leading of the spirit. That's why we must follow our personal convictions. That's why we must work out our own salvation. And to work it out with fear and with trembling. You see, we have lost the fear of God. And we need to get it back. Without that holy fear, we will never fully grasp the things we need to do. You see, that's the importance of personal convictions. Because they're either going to lead us to heaven, or they're going to cause us to fall short. It's your choice today which one is which. You see, the world, they want to... Make this idea of Jesus just being soft and just the lamb part of Jesus. But the Bible says he is the lion and he's the lamb. The world wants to see Jesus just as the lamb, but they forget that he's the lion. They forget that he has all power. They forget that there's going to be a judgment seat. They just say everybody's going to heaven no matter what. But that's not what the word of God says. There's going to be a judgment seat. Yes, it is. We got to wake up to that fact. It's coming soon. He's about to rapture the church. You got to make it today. You have to make it. You can't fall short. That's why we have to have personal convictions. That's why we need to have a revival of conviction in these last days. Because we live in a world and in a generation that seriously lacks conviction. So we'd all stand in this place this morning. We have to have a revival of personal convictions. You see, God is calling this church to a higher level. But we will never reach a higher level if we are not first obedient to the word of God submitted to our pastor and led by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes higher levels, sometimes higher levels take higher convictions. You see, forming personal convictions is not a one-time thing. Just like we need to repent every single day, we must be in a constant process of forming our convictions every day. This is why it is important to pray every single day, to read your Bible every single day, and to be at church every time the doors are open. It's through prayer. It's through studying the word. It's through hearing the preached word of God that we can actually form the personal convictions the right way. You have to remember this morning, that personal convictions should lead you closer to God and never further away. Remember that personal convictions should cause you to fulfill further the word of God. It is time for a revival of personal conviction. We must grasp this this morning because if we ever want to win our world, we have to have conviction we have to know what we believe. We have to understand the things that we stand for. We have to understand this today. In these last days, the world's going to get worse. But the church cannot follow suit.
The church has to stand strong for their convictions. The church has to stand strong upon the word of God. The church has to be submitted in these last days. Because if you're not submitted to pastor and you're not submitted to the word of God, you're going to be submitted to this world. Hollywood's going to submit you to what their agenda is. They're going to submit you. You're going to be submitted to something. But I would rather be submitted to the word of God today. I would rather be submitted to Jesus. I would rather be submitted to the man of God. Why don't we all lift our hands right now and pray? Oh, God, we need a revival of personal conviction. God, we open up our hearts to you to convict us, to lead us, and to guide us. God, we're going to hide this word in our hearts, and we're going to follow it. We're going to be obedient to your word and to your will. God, we're going to be submitted to our spiritual leadership. We will not be rebellious, but we will follow the man of God you've given us. God, we're going to follow your lead. We're going to listen to your voice to show us the way we need to take. We're going to follow you. Help us to establish those personal convictions, those personal standards in our life. Help us to establish those borders. Help us to establish those walls we need to put up in front of certain things. Help us to walk after you today. God, we thank you. We praise you today. Lord, you're so worthy. You're worthy of our very best. You're worthy of everything that we can give. So God, we don't want to do less, but we want to do more for you today. We thank you. We praise you, Jesus. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we can do a little better than that. Let's give him praise this morning. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Man, I, I appreciate the word of the Lord today. Hey, Amen. That was, that was profitable for us. That was profitable for us. And, and, and that was... You know, uh, that's a message you have to teach. And, and he, he did it well. You know, I was, couldn't help but thinking as he was uh, preaching and teaching, uh, just I thank God for um, my upbringing, my upbringing. You know, I, I come from a home where uh, my parents cared about what we wore, where we went, what we did. Um, you know, I had a mom and them that would, Tell them, hey, go, go take that off and change it. It, it don't fit no more, <laughs> you know. You know, just, and you didn't sass back, you know. You, 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 knew, you knew not to do that. You just knew not to do that. You know, I had, I had, parents, I had parents that told me, no, you're not going to date her. You know. You know, I know it sounds, it's crazy how that sounds old, old-fashioned. But to be honest with you, that's, I thank God for that. Uh, because now I look back on it, they, they were right. And I, I say this, parents, if you don't have personal convictions, don't expect for your kids to. I'm saying, I'm saying, that's just, I mean, that's just old school, you know. You know, you, you want personal convictions for your house as well, you know. You've got, you're watching a good movie, and at the end of the movie, when the best is fixing to come, and they use the word G GD, you got to have enough Holy Ghost in you to say, no, I, I, I don't care how the ending gets. i got to get that out of my house. That's personal convictions. you got to have the Holy Ghost. Couldn't help but thank him. God reminded me of this. My wife and I was headed, it was several years ago before we had children. I guess her life was easier back, back in those days. We was heading to St. Louis. I, I don't even know why we was heading to St. Louis. We had packed, got everything ready, uh, had plans to go there for a week. I believe I was going to do a job out there or something like that like that, got in the car and just, you know, I, I felt weird about it. Just felt weird. It's like, you know what? Something ain't right. God's telling us to, to not go. You know, I was expected to go, but I felt in the Holy Ghost, we're, we're not going to go. And so guess what? We spent all that time packing and guess what? We spent all that time unpacking. 
And, you know, I got looking and say, well, is there a wreck here or there? Because, I mean, I, I think I've had those moments where God told you, you know, you took the wrong turn by accident and find out there was a car accident. Am I the only one who's had that? Um, you know, but it's just, you know, I, I felt the Holy Ghost telling me don't do that. I don't know why, but the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you, you want to be so sensitive to God that when he whispers, you start running. Saying, don't, don't expect him to break out the megaphone. And when he whispers, you got to be sensitive to hear him. And this, I think what this sermon will do to us today is it will put perspective on our lives. Um, I had an old pastor, and I'll, I'll, I could re-preach this whole message. Thank you. I had an old pastor that would say stuff like, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. Right. You'll fall for everything. Come on. You know, and, and, and uh, this pastor cringes whenever you start hearing, you know, be submissive, pastor, be submissive. But be honest with you. Be honest with you, some pastors and some churches have, have different personal convictions. Let me tell you why. I had a pastor come here and preach here one time. I wanted to eat with him before, and he said, I, I asked him, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm a new pastor. Could you give me any, any advice? He said, he said, you need to capture and understand the spirits in your city. Right. You'll pastor a whole lot better if you understand the spirits that you're born against. And I understood before I started what spirits have taken down every single church in this area. So we built the wall really high in that area because I'm not falling in the same pit. Is, is that a big deal, Pastor? It's huge. <laughs> it's the difference between life and death. That's it. You say, well, that's Pastor. That's, that's too strict. No, it's not. They let down the same wall. The fox got in, killed all the saints, dispersed them all. Some of them don't even know if they're coming or going even yet today. Still trying to capture every, every lamb that we can. Let me tell you this place today. I, that don't make us more spiritual either. I want to add that. That don't make us better than any other church. We're not better than our church. We got problems. <laughs> I walked in the church today. We got problems. Okay? But that, but that means that we just raise the, we raise the standard high. We have a personal conviction. And we pray, God, whatever you want us to do, Lord, yeah. we're going to do it. Yeah. We're going to do it. Yeah. And I'm telling you, it's going to be worth it. Yeah. It's going to be worth it. Yeah. Man, thank you, Brother Blake, for preaching and teaching us today. It was fantastic. Yeah. That was a good Bible teaching. Good Bible teaching. Let's all pray. If you're a parent in this room, a grandparent, why don't, you, why don't you pray as well? God, we ask you, Lord, that you would give us strength, God. Give us strength to stand. I pray, Lord, that you give us encouragement, God, to go, God, and do what you want us to do. Let us be led by the Holy Ghost. I pray, Lord, that we'd have convictions in our life, God. Convictions that tell us, Lord, God, where to go, where not to go, what to do, what not to do, Jesus. Speak to parents in this room today, God. Speak to everyone. God, we need your, your leading and your guiding, God. Certainly we'll be lost without it. Lord, help us, God, to, to be better today than what we was yesterday. Give us encouragement, God. Help us, Lord, to develop strong personal convictions, Lord, that lead us closer to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 You may be dismissed for a little bit. We'll be back here shortly. Thank you very much.